everyone. Welcome to another other talk within the nine sided circle. This is our once monthly morning session where we do an extra talk every third Sunday morning of every month. And this is to give an opportunity for people in Europe and Africa and other such places a little closer to us an opportunity to show up, you know, because sometimes the other time doesn't work for everybody. And we're so glad that everyone has been able to make it today, whether you're live in person or watching on the replay. Here in spirit, we are so happy to have you here. So thank you. I am one of your hosts, Nora Kyle. And I am the other one of your hosts, Mushtaq Ali. Yep. And here we are yet again happy to be here so we do need to do our youtube spiel i guess that's my cue so <laughs> we would be ever so happy to welcome you to our youtube channel if you're watching us on youtube uh if you're not watching us on youtube you can't hear what i'm saying so it doesn't really matter but if you are watching us on youtube welcome and if you're not subscribed to our channel let me invite you nay beg you to hit that subscription button and uh, subscribe to our channel so that uh, you can be notified when we put out these incredibly cool videos um, and you will help us in our ongoing effort to stick it to the man we are trying to stick it to the man by getting up to a thousand uh subscribers so that we can work to turn off the ads that youtube is forcing onto our channel uh, we have never wanted this to be a commercial channel we did not want to make money off of our videos uh, but youtube in its infinite wisdom has decided that they can put advertising on any place that they want so uh, the only way we can get any control of that is to become part of their uh affiliate program and then we have some say over what goes on and doesn't go on and we can demonetize our own videos it's either that or we have to do things that that get our videos demonetized by saying that everybody who advertises on our channel sucks and we don't want to do that because <laughs> then youtube would get angry with us um, so we aren't saying that everything sucks uh, but if you happen to think that everything sucks and you don't want to uh, patronize any of the people who are forcing their ads onto our videos, that would be fine with us. We would um, not blame you. <laughs> we would not blame you at all because we don't know these people. Um, so anyway, subscribe to our channel and like our video because if you like our video, then take just a moment, hit that little thumbs up button. And that will make the arcane algorithms of YouTube notice us more and put our videos out and more people will see them and more people will watch these and then more people will be confused. And then more people will make comments and ask questions down below uh, in the comment section, which we really enjoy. So if you are watching this, and you would like to comment on this or any other video that we do, we would be very, very happy to see your comment. And we will try our darndest to uh, answer every question that you have. Even if we don't know the answers, we'll make up something that sounds really plausible. So We do our best. We do our best, yes. Yes. So that's the YouTube spiel. And it's basically the same spiel we do every week. Yeah, so we're going to keep doing it until the entire universe is is subscribed to our channel. <laughs> Join us in our quest, essentially. Yes. Yes. All right. So thanks. Do we have any announcements we need to make? Uh, it's cold out today. Yeah. Burr. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Weather Got report. out the big guns with the heater. Yeah. All right. So this week we are. You know, we're going to take a more creative approach and we are going to share a soupy story today this is a story about one of my favorite historical figures in the sufi tradition rabia and we're going to hear more about her 
Yes. Yes. Yeah, All as right, it turns check. out, there, there is a whole bunch of stories involving these two people. Um, mm. Everybody's heard of Rabia. You know, she, was, she wrote poetry and all of this. She was considered one of the great saints of her time. Yeah, and then one there's, of the earliest Sufi yeah, saints. Yeah, yeah she's, she's in the, the first generation after the prophet, as is Hassan al-Basri. Uh, who was another great Sufi saint and somebody who many of the Sufi tariqas include in their lineage. Uh, and there's a bunch of these stories because they both lived in Basra uh, at the same time. And these stories are about their interactions. And interestingly, especially for the time, uh, Rabia is always the teacher in these stories, and Hassan is the sometimes incredibly stupid student. Um, and I have always gotten a kick out of that. And it's like, uh, sometimes these stories will make you uncomfortable, and we like them. So today we are going to look at, at one of the, the many, many stories of... Uh, Rabia and Hassan, and this has to do with uh, um, Hassan's uh, initial illumination. So that's what we got going for us today. Shall I just leap right into the story? I think you should just leap right in. So. Rabia, the Sufi saint and mystic, would go every day to the marketplace. And there she would speak with various people who might benefit from her words. And for some years, she would pass Hassan al-Basri sitting before the door of the mosque and praying to God, saying, God, open the door. Please open the door. Let me in. Every other day, Besides today, Rabia would pass without comment. Hassan would sit there and he would cry. Tears would be coming down his face and he would be passionately crying, open the door. Every day, Rabia would shake her head as she went by, but she wouldn't say a word. And Hassan would still be there and he'd be weeping and, you know, rending his clothes and his passion and all of this. Thoroughly making a scene, yeah. Thoroughly making a scene with, with his desire for, for God to open the door to him. Finally, one day, Rabia went up to him and went, BAP! Hey, you! Stop all this nonsense! The door is open! In fact, you're already inside. Hassan looked at Rabia, and in that moment, he woke up. Looking into the eyes of Rabia, he bowed down, he touched her feet and said, you came in time, otherwise I would have been calling my whole life. For years I've been doing this. Where have you been before? And why, I know that you pass every day on the street. Why today you say this to me and not years ago? Rabia replied, yes, but the truth can only be said at the right moment in a certain place, in a certain context. I was waiting for that moment of ripeness inside of you, and today it arrived. So I came to you, and I told you. Yesterday, if I had told you, you would have felt irritated. You would have been angry. You would have reacted antagonistically. You may have even told me, you have disrupted my prayers. It is not right to disturb anybody's prayer. And it's true, even a king was not allowed to disturb the prayers of a beggar, even a criminal, uh, a murderer uh, in any Islamic country at the time. If he was praying, the guards had to wait until he was done with his prayer before they grabbed him. Uh, and Rabia said to him, I have wanted to tell you this all these years, that Hassan, don't be a fool. The door is open. In fact, you are already in. But I had to wait for the right moment. 
And that's the story. What do you think? What does it mean? Does it mean anything? Don't everybody talk at once. But imagine you're, you're Hassan Ibasri and you're sitting there and you're just crying out to heaven that you want in, that you, you want to come inside, you want to be part of the inner circle. And something is a, keeping you out. Wow. I have a comment. Oh, Jonathan. Okay. Story. Yeah, sure. And then while, well, yep. Yeah. Jonathan it, it, goes. It appears from the story that he had a sincere hunger. But I question whether it was sincere or whether it was uh, like a fake hunger. And that he he had to go through years of showing consistent dedication and to uh to develop more sincerity or to, to to develop enough hunger that if if and when the doors would open he would be ready for the challenges that he would meet on entering the doors could be. I like to think that he was sincere, sincere the, the whole time, but that his ego kept him in a state of separation. And it took all of that tapas, all of that heat to burn away that sensation of separation for that one moment where Rabia could uh, say the right words and wake him up. Yeah. I want to see what Weil has to add, and then Levita also raised her hand. Yeah. When I was listening um, and just hearing uh, how uh, Hassan was described to be, you know, begging and making a scene uh, and asking for something that inevitably ended up being something he already had. And not only was the door open, but he was on the other side. That that sort of makes me feel that, or makes me reflect that uh, we often at times um, ask for things, whether it's asking, ask God for things like money, security, wealth, whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, but um, perhaps the truth is, we already have what we're asking for but we suffer in thinking and believing we don't and uh it, 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 i just felt sorry for hassan suffering um but i guess he had to suffer until the right moment uh, came uh, came to being there was an element that i thought was you know similar to how your, your classic Shaolin Kung Fu student has to has to stay at the door for however long until the teacher uh, accepts him or her. There was an element of initiation that I felt there, but um, I'm not too sure whether that reflects anything truthful. But uh, it, it just made me feel that I think uh, a lot of us are asking for something we already have. It's just we haven't realized it or or haven't accepted it in the shape that it's already been given. We're insisting on, 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 on something very, very specific to occur, where the essence of what we're asking is already there. It's just that we're suffering because we want it to be exactly how we want it to be. Fascinating. Yeah, I think that adds a whole layer to it all. Thank you so much for that, Will. Because I do think that's an important aspect to this. So much of what we ask for, yeah, we have a very specific image of what we think that's going to look like and how we think that's going to show up. And if it shows up differently, we often tend to reject it. And act, as was said, antagonistically towards it. 
Yeah. Yeah, the, there is the famous story of the, the man sitting on top of his house during the flood. You all know that story, right? Mm, not sure. So, there is a guy. Oh, yes. He had a house. Yeah. And there was a flood, and he climbed up on the flood. And he was a very devout man. So he prayed to God. He said, God, please rescue me for this, from this flood. And a guy came by on a boat. And he said, hey, you want to ride out of here? And the man said, no, God will take care of me. Then the waters kept rising and a guy came by in a helicopter and threw down a rope and said, hey, grab the rope. I'll take you up out of here so you don't drown. And the man said, no, I have faith in God. God will take care of me. And so the helicopter took off to rescue smarter people and the man drowned. And he goes up to heaven and he's pissed and he goes up to God and he goes, I prayed for you to rescue me and you didn't. And God looked at him and he said, what? I sent the boat. I sent the helicopter. What do you want? An engraved invitation? I always like that story. It's an old one, but it's a goodie. It's one to, <laughs> to, to remind us all. Exactly. Yes. So, Lavita, did you have something you wanted to share? Um, what came to my mind was how, and I, I think I've heard this, I've heard this many times, I've experienced it on both ends myself, how much smarter our parents get as we get older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? You know, it's like, okay, um, so we want what we want as children and our parents are telling us stuff. And, and then one day we're old enough and we get it. Even if we don't agree, we get why they're saying it, mm -hmm. even if we don't agree. And, and that's kind of like what that story, that original story reminded me of that, you know, there, you're finally in a place to hear what your parents have been telling you for 10,000 years, you know? And then at that point, your, pa your poor parents are like going, oh my God, the phone's ringing again. Why are you calling me? So, <laughs> so that's, that's that, you know, like being able to hear is just as important as being, having access to the information. Yep. Being able to hear, being able to receive, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So the interesting question is, since the door was open and he was already inside, what kept him from seeing that? Why could he not see that? Why did he have to stand there and cry and make prayers and be in states of longing all that time when all he had to do was wake up because that's the situation that many of us not not anybody here but people out there find themselves in all the time i mean i've definitely experienced that myself even recently I can own up to that, but at some point, thank God, you kind of get hit with that slap from Rabia that's like, hey, pay attention. You are distracting yourself from the truth. May, may I just say something, please? Please. Um, I, I noticed that the story has an outside source helping a person wake up. Mm -hmm. Does that insinuate that one cannot wake up themselves, but requires somebody else to prod them, poke them, shock them? I guess I'm asking, does, um, in a weird kind of way, does, are those that are awake selected to be so, as opposed to somebody deciding by themselves, if that makes sense? Yeah, and I think it can go either way. Uh, I think that any human being 
can potentially wake up all on their own, um, almost by accident sometimes. I mean, part of what helped me do my initial awakening was hating my fifth grade teacher. And I mean, I, I loathed this guy. He was a terrible human being. There's nothing about him that I liked. And I enjoyed proving him wrong. And one day he said in class to everybody there, you can't stop thinking. You can't not think. And I took that as a challenge. And so I invented meditation when I was in fifth grade. Because I would sit there and work at not thinking. I would work on stopping the dialogue in my head just to prove him wrong. And that may have been one of the reasons that other things happened down the road because I found that I could stop the dialogue in my head and I liked it. It was nice when everything was quiet. So it can happen. Of course, then I had to have people tell me certain important facts later on when I was able to hear them. But uh, so I think that it is possible, but I also think that it is really, really hard to do it on your own. And you are more likely to make rookie mistakes that will get you in trouble and hold you back than if you have somebody who can tell you certain things speaking from experience perhaps speaking speaking from experience yes <laughs> you know you can figure it out all on your own but it sure helps if there are people who have figured it out before you who can just like tell you don't do the stupid thing just mm -hmm. don't do the stupid thing do do this other thing instead yeah and there's a humility that comes with that too yeah yeah I haven't got that part yet, but I'm working. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so Lolita says, perhaps because what he wanted didn't look the way he expected it to look. This is in answer to your question. Yeah. That's possible. And I think that can be very distracting. Yeah. And it's possible that he kept thinking that there was a door and it was closed. I mean, think about it. If you were convinced that you can't go through a door, you can't go through the door, even if the door is open, even if the door doesn't exist. I mean, that's almost like a learned helplessness thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, it kind of is. And was there a Yazidi? What's that? Was Hassan a Yazidi boy? No, he wasn't. Um, he was a, a Muslim. Uh, he was born and raised in Basra, which is, where is Basra now? Is it in Iraq? Iraq, Iraq. Yeah, say. Iraq, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, uh, yeah, so he wasn't Yazidi. Um, What makes you think he might have been? Because he, he, he set himself in a circle. There was someone else to break that circle. He has to surrender. Yeah. I think if you uh, used the Enneagram, he was very busy at point five. And he has to surrender. surrender. There's yes. I mean, the lady Rabia. That's what I, yeah, yeah. and the, uh, the st story later on, the man who was on the, on the roof, um, he is uh, dealing with his will, he has an objective uh, God, he did, he did, he, 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 uh, uh, he has a certain image of God, and uh, if the boat is coming or or uh, the chopper, he didn't recognize its uh, uh, the representation of, of the Lord. Yes. So uh, for those of you who have not read 
say meetings with remarkable men, he's referring to a uh, a myth that uh, a Yazidi, if you draw a circle around him, cannot leave the circle, which appeared in Gurdjieff's childhood narration. Um, I don't know if it's true or not, but it makes for an interesting story. And uh, I have seen things like it. Uh, But we're pretty sure that the only thing that keeps the Yazidi inside the circle in that story is the Yazidi's own mind. Hmm. So we have a question from... Yes. Were you going to say something? No. Okay. Uh, what else is, so how do you know when it's the right time to speak truth, capital T, truth? Um, you must develop your intuition. And work on your own ego too. Yes. I mean, let's say you want to tell someone what's what, is that because you want to have one up over them and put them down because look at how stupid they are. They don't know the truth. I will show them. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we deal with that all the time. Yes. There are people who think that they know and you can always tell when they don't think that when they don't actually know when they think that they know, because they will say, everybody else is wrong and this is the truth. We're about to deal with that in some of our video comments. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we say that facetiously too. Yeah. But you can usually tell uh, that we are, are not taking ourselves terribly seriously. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope. We do our best not to. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah. That, yeah, the, uh, to, yeah. Yes, Jonathan. Yeah, the that seems to me that there's a difference between a momentary waking up. Let's say Hassan did Hassan have a momentary waking up, or was it something more permanent? With with like he woke up and understood. Like Levita's account was of the child who when he grew up he he got it with his parents he he woke up and understood because if it if hassan just had a momentary waking up and then he fell asleep again then is he going to have to wait another 10 years for them for the everything to to come just right to wake up again that's a good question and the answer is we don't know but since there is more than one story of Rabia and uh, Hassan, and Hassan is usually the butt of the joke in these stories, um, or the straight man, or however you want to put it, I would imagine that he would wake up and then go back to sleep and then wake up and go back to sleep like most people do. In my experience, the, the, the process of waking up does not just happen once and done and the people who i've run across who think that it's once and done are usually people i don't like being around because they still have all of their ego stuff stuck to them um, and it doesn't matter i mean my process has been one of oh i'm i'm awake i'm asleep i'm awake i'm asleep i'm awake i'm asleep and the trick is to make those moments of awakeness go longer and longer. But even Gautama Buddha slept at night. Think about that. There is no being on this planet, no human being on this planet that doesn't sleep. And if somebody thinks that they are then the easy thing is to put them in a room with a locked door and a camera and watch them and see if they actually stay awake the whole time that they're in there for say oh five days because usually if you're awake for five days without sleep you die uh, or you go crazy at least 
but I have not seen uh, anybody who can do that. And until I can actually see somebody who can stay awake for, say, three weeks a month and not go crazy and not die, I'm pretty sure that your body has constrained you to do sleep for its sake. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That was the point I was trying to make. Was mm. so, you, so you woke up. Big deal. So you woke up in a big way. It's a big deal. It's like... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's not that you woke up, it's are you awake now? Mm -hmm. That's always the question. Are you awake now? In this instant, are you awake? And if the answer is yes, and it probably is, then that's all we can hope for. <laughs> Lovita says, enlightenment is definitely not a Ronco TM product, as in set it and forget it. Yeah. Yeah. Who did we lose? We lost somebody. Yeah. That's a shame. Oh, I think it is Jonathan. Oh, yeah. He's always got a bad be able to come back. Yeah. There, he's... there he is. You made it back. There he is. <laughs> Welcome back. Sorry we lost you for a sec. I, I, I knew I had to sign out to get my video back, but I, yeah. I didn't want to sign out. <laughs> All right. Well, you didn't miss anything. We waited for you. Okay. Actually, we were talking about you behind your back while you were there. <laughs> oh, nah. All right, what's next? Did you have something you wanted to share, Mushtaq, before we uh, segue? Probably, but whatever it is, I don't remember. So carry mm -hmm. on. Carry on. Hmm. Maybe I should poke at people now. Yeah, poke people. David, what's coming up for you? I um, like the similarity between the flood story and the story with Rabia and Hassan. It seemed like um, waking up would be right in front of you as much as a helicopter in front of you would be. So it really put the image in my mind. Yeah. I like that. That's a really good uh, connection. Yeah. I mean, I think we forget just how, I'm gonna use the, the big word imminent, like right in front of us, as you say, waking in up really face. is, yeah. <laughs> and we forget that we get caught up in so many other distracting, distracting things that for some reason make us oblivious to that. Just like, you know, thinking a door is closed when it's really open, wide open. Thanks, David. Malou and Roland, what's coming up for you guys? I'm thinking I'm so busy with, with wanting to find the door that I don't see that there is none. <laughs> mm. Yep. Isn't that funny how that happens? I mean, I find that relatable for sure. Yeah, it's like at some level I understand it and then often I'm like, ah, oh, I don't understand it. I'm still looking for the door and I still don't find it. I'm like, yeah, because it's not there, but I just don't get out of that. Like, thinking, yeah, it's not there. It's, I'm already in, but I'm still looking for the door. So how does that work? <laughs> it's 
struggle is real. And yet it's not, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like the kid in the Matrix going, there is the trick no is to under spoon. there is no spoon. Yes, <laughs> you do that so well. How about you, Roland? I have to think of uh, La Vida's favorite statement. Uh, I find myself in the picture and I don't like it. <laughs> I am amused. Thanks, guys. That was good. <sighs> Jayash, how about you? Yeah, so I feel uh, Hassan is blessed that he has got that moment because journey is long and souls are traveling since eternity. But he has got a moment that uh, master told that now is you are awakened. Uh, so, and other thing is, uh, when he was praying uh, to God or Allah, whatever, then what happened in that moment? Because he was praying uh, for what? And suddenly Drabya told him that you are in. So what changed? <laughs> yeah, the only thing that changed was his perspective. Which is the, a, an interesting thing. And, and that's, that, that gets down to the core of the truth is there was never a door. You made up the door. So his, pers his perspective changed. The nice thing is that he doesn't have to sit in front of the mosque every day now. What will he, yeah. what will he do with his life now? <laughs> yeah, that's always a good question. What will he do with his life? Go out and be the, the father of a hundred different Sufi orders. Mm. And yet, no one would have expected that necessarily. No. And Look at this everybody, yeah. yeah, everybody forgets that it was Rabia who gave him the kick that he needed to wake up. Yes. Yep. And that's, so that's something is, to is, remember. Is merit attracted Rabia? Say again. His merit attracted Rabia's grace or nudge? Uh, perhaps. My, yeah. my theory is that Rabia is what we call the Qadub al-Zaman, the, the pole of the world in her time. Uh, I want to make sure I understood the question. I'm not sure I did since I'm hard of so, hearing. I think uh, Hassan's, uh, I'm repeating it, Hassan's merit attracted Rabia's nudge or push or grace. Mm. And then Mushtaq said, yeah, she's the Kutu, yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things, uh, it's a bit of a segue, but that's one of the things that people tend to miss in all of these stories of Rabia and Hassan is that she's the teacher in all of these. Scandalous. Very scandalous. Hmm. Well asks Al Qutub Al Zaman, do we have one of those now? Who is um, our Rabia today? That's a good question because my understanding is that we do not know. Uh, yes, there is one. We do not know who it is. We will likely never know who it is. And if we do, we will not know who it was until after they have passed and somebody else has taken on the job. And it is best that way. Um, because otherwise you get all of these people going around going, I am the pole of the world. Mm. Yeah, follow me, obey me. Um, so I think God keeps them hidden. 
and uh, you know, pretty much every Sufi is convinced that his teacher is the the Qutub al Zaman, which is as it should be, as long as they don't go around telling everybody else. We're assuming that what they experience is true for any anyone other than them. Because then it gets political. You know what comes to mind? That show, The Messiah. Yeah. Or Messiah. It was a Netflix show, and they only did one season of it because it was too scandalous. But, yeah. It's still one of the best things they ever produced. Mm -hmm. It was a series. I think it had, like, eight or nine episodes. People should yeah. check that out. It was fun. I mean, not fun in the like, wow, cool, but like, whoa, this is deep and it's making me think. Yeah, and you never know what the truth is. All you know is what people project on it. Uh, the mm -hmm. basic premise is this guy shows up um, in Syria, I think, and he's preaching. And he's, he's speaking in Arabic and, uh, you know, he's telling people to get their shit together. Then the next thing you know, he is leading a group of people to the Israeli border who need sanctuary, and they all get stopped there, of course. And uh, he leaves them there and actually slips. Doesn't he slip across into Israel? And he's now speaking Hebrew. Yeah, I think and, so. Yeah, and then he ends up in America, and he's speaking English and and talking to everybody and wherever he goes there are some people who think that he's some sort of messiah or prophet and some people who think that he's some sort of dangerous maniac and every time you think you found out the truth about him something changes mm -hmm. and you end up never knowing and you have to make up your own mind but I thought it was brilliant. I, I watched the entire series twice. I liked it. So mm -hmm. Yeah, same. I mean, it really got its claws into me. That's for sure. So, yeah, recommend. Check that out. Um, Levita says, perhaps what people leave out is, quote, for me, unquote, with respect to their teacher being the best. Yeah. I think people do forget that, yes. They forget that a lot. Yeah. And it is the duty of a teacher to make sure that they don't forget that. So we have one person we haven't checked in with yet. I want to make sure I pronounce your name well. Is it Saifi Saifi? Please correct me. Yes, yes, I have to believe Saifi Barmal. Thank you so much. So, how what's coming up for you about this story? As far as I feel, um, it is just based on my reading and knowledge. This is not my perception. So, I'm just commenting that the question become became quest. For Hassan and Rabia um, got that right moment that this is the moment of penetration. So after seeing in the eyes of Rabia, Hassan bows down and realizes the fact that he is already in. The cru crucial moment was seeing into his eyes. So something got penetrated at that very moment and Afterward, she explains him that this was the moment. So I cannot explain it in uh, other words, but I can just sense that uh, moment of penetrations are in deep receptivity. Mm. Yes. Yeah, you could say that, that it was uh, a moment of Shaktipat. Uh, I think that that's, that's a good word. Uh, more people understand that word than baraka, which um, is uh, the Arabic. Yes, 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 yes. Mm. 
Thank you. Yeah, so, so that that actually is a very important point. That in that moment there was a transference. It, it was almost like uh, an initiation that helped mm -hmm. Hassan open, and he wasn't ready mm -hmm. for it until then. Yes. Yes. She was passing through and watching him every day. The, this is the narration of the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, she stops at certain moment. And then things turn in different ways. Exactly right. That I got the meaning of the story. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Safi. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, someone asked earlier, I think it was, uh, well, yeah, how do you know when the right time to speak the truth is? And yeah, where is that moment of penetration? Again, we have to think about, you know, if we, if we see a moment as a parent, perhaps, or as a friend, Sometimes we hold back from sharing, you know, our perspective or whatever, because we know our friend is not in a place to hear it. How do we know when they are? That can be tricky. Yeah, the trick to that is you have to be in the place where you can say it. Exactly, yeah. And when you're in that place, there, there kind of is no you. It goes back to uh, the old hadith of uh, you become the uh, eyes through which God sees and the mouth through which God speaks and the hands through which God acts and the ears through which God hears and all of that. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not about you. It's yes. about sharing that, that message. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing with Rabia is that she was in the place that she could deliver that. If you or I had walked up to Hassan at the same moment and done the same thing, it probably wouldn't have worked. Mm. So it's a confluence of right yeah. conditions. The message has to be delivered correctly and from somebody who is in the proper state. Mm -hmm. Yes. In a practical sense, sometimes that's why it helps to take time to breathe and to become centered before initiating a difficult conversation. Can you stay grounded through that conversation and present and keep your ego out of it? You need to set yourself up for success sometimes. Well, wow. I, I might have mentioned this point earlier, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but I'm just certain verses from the Quran are coming to my mind that, that basically speak about the fact that being able to do good is something you're permitted. It's, 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 it's almost like an invitation. So when you do a good thing, there's a blessing in that. You've been given the space to see something good to occur. And at the same time, there are people that don't get that blessing. They don't get the opportunity to do good. So I'm just thinking whether there are other verses or other ways of thinking about it, but the, the, the words that come to mind is somehow I'm getting the feeling that waking up, doing good, being present, being truthful is an invitation we get given and it's up to us to accept because a lot of people don't get that invitation at all. And I think some people might say, but that's unfair. Why did this person get invited and not that person to get invited? But before we go into that, is there, is there any resonance of truth in what I'm saying that waking up or doing good is actually an invitation. You've been selected. You have been invited to take part in this uh, awakening state 
whereas the majority may not be given that invitation for whatever reason, logical or, or unlogical. I, I, can't, I can't think of... Yeah, I would that. say that you're probably right with the caveat that everybody gets the invitation just like the door is, is, is open. The invitation is there universally. Most people never allow themselves to see it. How does that land while? It, it, it lands, it lands well. Um, but I, I just sometimes feel that, I don't know whether rightly or wrongly, that there, there are certain people that are almost, it's gonna, it, it, may, it may make me sound a bit awful right now, but it's just an observation. There are some people that are just nasty, man. I mean, they w I wouldn't want them to get an invitation. I mean, if it was up to me, they're so nasty, so, so, so incredibly bad. Uh, but the premise is they're also invited. Is, is that what we're saying? Yeah, but the, their state keeps them from seeing the invitation. It's like there's a story of a feud that started because... Uh, there was going to be this great party and everybody in the town was invited. Uh, and the person throwing on the, throwing the party put out invitations and in, he sent out a whole bunch of people with these invitations to deliver them. And this one person, um, the invitation came and it was put in the crook of a tree because they didn't have a, mailboxes had not been invented at this point. So it was there. And for some reason, he never noticed it. So he assumed that he was the one person who was not invited to this big party and became upset and angry and hurt and all of this kind of stuff and pretty much went to war with the person who threw the party. And the, you know, even though the person told him, I sent you an invitation. He was like, no, you didn't. You didn't send me no invitation. I didn't get no invitation. And this went on for years until one day the tree fell. The tree got old and it was blown over with the wind. And he looked down and there was the invitation that had been there sitting in the crook of that tree the whole time. So I think it's a bit like that. Not seeing the invitation can make you mean. So it's like uh, uh, rain is falling, but some people are covered with umbrella or in, inside their house, not yeah. want to get wet. But rain is falling everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And the rain falls on the just and the unjust, as it says. So Safety. I don't know Did if you... any of that is is true, but. Uh, I like to think that it is. Yeah. It's certainly worth meditating on. Yeah. Somebody else has their mic open who had a question or an answer. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to check with Safi because I noticed he's still unmuted. I wanted to know if you had anything else you wanted to share. I just wanted to share that Mm. Our son was sitting exactly outside the mosque and asking the door to open. So he was frequently in the state of a quest, as far as I understand from the story, that the quest uh, should be penetratively in the, in the center of our being. And after that long, long lasting quest, one receives small glimpses. <sighs> Is 
that uh, that thing what i was thinking that this is also the moral of the story could be thanks sophie Anybody else have some last thoughts to share? No? Okay. Any last thoughts, Mushtaq? No, I think that we've, we have kicked things up enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we will invite everybody, if you think of more stuff, either comment on the video or bring it to the forum and we will talk about it there. Yeah. Unless you're really shy, then you can message us privately, but it's more fun to do it on the forum because we're not the only ones who have answers. Sometimes no. all we have is questions. Sometimes, and you know, you guys have shared a lot of interesting stuff today. So thank you for that. I keep uh, thinking about, you know, there is no door, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. So with that, I guess we can go to Brady Bunch mode. And we just did. So here we are in Brady Bunch mode so that everybody can see everybody, at mm -hmm. least on the video. And uh... we will wave to everyone who's watching and to each other, of course. All right. Yes. Bye. So, Thank bye, you folks. for being here. See you next time.